Hello everyone. Uh, in a previous video where I talked about uh, data center transformation which results in migration of servers or application, right? And uh, I also talked about uh, how do you architect the network setup for migration, right? Let's take the topic of network cutover for this video and dwell further into the details. As I said before, this is a huge and complex topic and I'm thinking of covering this in several parts so that it will be easier to grasp for everyone. This video will give you a high level view of what is network cutover and where and when do we really need to consider this and different design scenarios, uh, cutover strategies and whether any risks associated with these options we discuss. This first volume will create an understanding of this topic and clarify any doubts you had in high level and I'll go through in more detailed view of each sections or topics in consecutive videos. Let's look at what is network cutover or network migration. When you migrate the servers from one location to another and if you want to retain the IP address of those servers, then moving those servers alone will not complete the migration. You also need to migrate the associated network that is the uh, VLAN or the subnet or the gateway associated with that VLAN or the prefix advertised for that subnet. It's all synonymous when I say migrating the network from source to target infrastructure. You can't have the same gateway address or the same network in both locations at the same time. Hence, network cutover as a separate activity to be planned properly and executed carefully. Just to give you a graphical view and in an utmost simplistic view to understand how the network cutover happens. Uh, what you see is a source and target data centers in left and right respectively. There is just uh, one subnet or a VLAN configured in a router and there are few VMs attached to that subnet. While preparing the target for migration, there is a router deployed and same VLAN subnet is configured. But notice there is no gateway enabled yet in the target. Servers are migrated all at once or sequentially depending on the migration approach once all the servers are moved out of the source network now it's a good time to initiate the tran network cutover process you disable the gateway in source first and enable the same address in the target router as the gateway for the migrated servers once the gateway is locally enabled in the target and the crucial task of all to advertise the specific network prefix from the target network this means that Migrated servers or application can be reached directly in the target DC over the WAN after completing this step. We looked at this slide in the last video as well to understand the sequence and stages of different activities happening in a migration. The discovery of the current environment will happen throughout the project lifecycle. You start doing the migration strategy for the overall migration. Network migration, design and project plan are done together and goes hand in hand with the overall migration strategy. Once planning is completed, migration tasks are kickstarted and this is the stage where network cutover is also executed if it is applicable to the respective migration scope. There are two different scenarios in general that may happen based on our migration design decisions. Uh, you, you change the IP address of the servers when migrated to the target or Servers are migrated with the same address and expected to work the same way from the target infrastructure. So let's go through a few important design considerations on each of the scenario in high level. Let's look at the first scenario. Once servers are migrated to the target, uh, existing IPs will be changed with the new addresses based on the target design. These migrated servers are attached to a new VLAN which reside only within each target DC and a respective subnet with its gateways owned by the local router. So in such scenarios, um, applications will have few implications that need to be clearly understood by the application team and the infrastructure team. So I listed few of such considerations here. So in case application code has the IP address hard coded instead of using FQDN names. So this brings the dependency of uh, code changes and that also impacts the migration timelines. And DNS entry needs to be changed with the new IP address after the migration. You need to discuss and document who will do and how long will it take to reflect within or external to the network. So the scope and timelines are crucial for a successful migration. You need to make sure uh, end users are using only FQDN names to reach these migrated servers and not configured to access these 
with actual IP addresses. So this will again impact the application connectivity post migration. And uh, with change of IP addresses, uh, you may expect configuration changes in existing security infrastructure like firewall rules, uh, network address translations, forward and reverse proxying and so on. So this needs thorough investigation of application interdependencies and flows. This may take additional efforts and become more challenging if not discovered properly before migration. Any whitelisting done with existing IP addresses in any part of the communication needs to be updated with new IP addresses, especially in public IP scenarios. This is something to be worried about while application exposed to internet. You would have noticed application IP changes bring in several dependencies on the application team and few others. And this will not be an ASIS sort of migration anymore. This will be the reason why usually application team and migration team insist on retaining the IP address when they wanted to execute the migration quickly in a lift and shift model or without the need to worry about all those application interdependencies. The fact is that many enterprises do not have application architecture and all interdependencies understood properly. At least it will be true for part of their legacy landscape. Hence, uh, we may need to go for the second approach, which is basically retaining the server or application address in the target data center. But IP retention requirement introduces a lot more complexity than the previous option. At the same time, this simplifies post-migration tasks related to application and infrastructure changes discussed before. Since this facilitates the ASIS migration, uh, this would be the preferred option in many migration projects. Here, the crucial part is the design of layer to extension solution between source and target network. That's the only way for the servers to retain the IP in target when there are still active IP addresses in the same subnet in source. Assuming the scenario where it is not possible to move all those servers within a VLAN or a subnet together in the same migration window, gateway cutover cannot be done in halfway, hence the need of layer to extensions. In this approach, you need to consider the migration as complete only when the network cutover is complete and the servers are reachable directly from the target data center. Network cutover, I mean migrating a subnet, cannot be considered as a standalone activity and that needs so much of planning, otherwise it brings havoc to the production. Also, you need to understand the impact on the migrated application during the usage of layer 2 extensions, at least till the time the network is migrated to target. Uh, it may have performance and operational impact to the migrated application. Only solution is to fast track the network cutover to mitigate such risks. Now having understood the different approaches, choosing the IP retention design brings network cutover into the scope. So let's understand various options for network cutover. When all the servers are migrated from a specific VLAN, you will have an option to migrate only the respective VLAN or subnet. That's the subnet specific migration. There are two important considerations here, routing changes and uh, firewall changes across the enterprise network. If the source design uses a dynamic routing protocol, migrating one subnet from source to target can easily be propagated throughout the network by advertising the specific migrated subnet from target data center. It's easier said, but uh, this needs a clear understanding of source network, uh, the routing design uh, before making these decisions. There are certain design scenarios need more manual routing changes across the network each time when one or few subnets migrated. So this may create more risks and impact to the migration plan itself. The second option is the host specific migration, which is useful when there are scenarios where migrating the entire subnet is challenging. So you advertise more precise network like a host route or a slash 32 route of the migrated servers. It is a useful strategy and may be used in scenarios when the performance impact to the migrated application is higher due to the traffic harpening over layer 2 extensions. This brings different complexity to the network in terms of routing. Here the crucial part is that we need to perform the cleanup activity later on once all the servers in the respective subnet is moved to target. This may involve further routing changes in the network. Just like I mentioned for the previous strategy, 
it's mandatory for a thorough assessment of source routing design and analyzing the downsides in the network before choosing this option finally the big bang migration it's all about migrating all the gateways on or the networks to target together in a same window in certain environments it may not be possible to migrate individual networks in a sequential way due to some network design limitations or it may need more efforts than it what it gains hence maybe it's beneficial to migrate all the networks in a single window migrating the entire network together has its own complexities and drawbacks obviously you need a bigger maintenance window depending on the size of the source environment or uh, any unresolved issues during the migration entire change need to be rolled back which again may take a considerable amount of time you may see far too many changes in a single window depending on the size of the environment hence uh, testing everything and fixing any issues within a stipulated time will re- will be really a challenge okay so let's conclude what we understood so far it's very crucial to understand the source network design and your entire migration success is dependent on that and the more clarity you gain during solutioning phase rather than in a delivery will uh, make a huge difference in migration projects it will help in identifying the scope and efforts needed and cost associated with it for example knowing the l2 stretch requirement uh, late in a delivery phase will have a impact in the efforts and add further delays to the project and for me the most important part is that highlighting and documenting all the risks and limitations which i explained especially the complexities uh, the layer 2 solutions adding to the migration project all right uh, that's it thank you for watching this video and good luck